Hello, welcome to another slow chat. My name's Topher Field, and uh, slow chats are where I kind of unwind a little bit. I relax a little bit. Normally, these days, actually, it's not how it started, but more recently, I've been interviewing people and chatting with really interesting people who have really deep knowledge in certain areas that I want to learn more about. And you, of course, are invited to come along and learn more about it as well. Uh, in this particular case, I'm going back more to, I guess, the origins of the slow chat format. I don't have a guest this week. Uh, I have something very exciting that I want to be telling you all about. And you've probably seen it on my page already. If, you, if you're on my Facebook page or if you're on my Instagram, uh, if you're on YouTube, you won't have seen it. Uh, but if you're on my Facebook or on my Instagram, you'll already know probably uh, that as of today, I've gone official. It is official. I am working on my first ever feature documentary, which is fantastic. So if you think about most of my work over the years, they're not feature length, and that's because I've been trying to appeal to an online audience. I've been trying to pack things into a short amount of time, uh, and they tend to be based on me doing an enormous amount of research and then me personally presenting that research to you as the viewer. That's not the format of this. This is going very much classic feature length documentary. So most of it is going to be made up of interviews that I'm doing with some fascinating people, people whose names you know, whose faces you know, um, people that have been right in the thick of it for the last 18 months. Uh, and then, of course, mixing those interviews with actual footage from on the ground as it happened and telling the story. And I will then be narrating. And essentially, my job is to try and do as little as possible in terms of the amount of time I'm on the screen. My job is to try and tell as much of the story as I can using everybody else. And then I just come in to then tie everything together and make sure that the story flows properly. So that's what I'm working on. But uh, we're going to give people just a little bit more time to filter in. Uh, and those of you that know the slow chat format, you know that one of the ways that I like to relax uh, is with these things here. This is a Perdomo 10th anniversary reserve in their sun grown. And this is a beautiful, beautiful cigar. It's called a Figurado. Notice how it kind of gets narrower there and then it gets narrower again on the end. It's it's thickest in the middle. This is what's called a Figurado and it creates a really interesting flavor journey as you go through the cigar uh, because as you change the diameter, the ratio of wrap to fill changes and the flavor that you get from the wrap versus the fill is different. So what you get with a Figurado is actually a continuously changing flavor profile even more so than you would ordinarily get with uh, any other kind of cigar. So <clears throat> that is what I'll be smoking tonight. I'm going to start with now, I have a friend who is extremely sophisticated when it comes to whiskies. I'm not. I'm a relative novice. And he assures me that this is not pronounced Le Dague. He assures me that this is pronounced Le Cheque. And I don't know if he's telling me the truth or if he's trolling me. So if anyone knows, apparently it's Gaelic or something like that. So if anyone can answer that problem for me and tell me whether I'm being trolled or whether it's the truth, is this Le Dague? Is this Le Cheque? I would appreciate that. I'm going to kill this bottle tonight. There's not a lot of it left. It's also a very light whiskey, um, not a particularly complex flavor. It's it's lovely, but it's not particularly complex. And once that's done, I'll be moving across to a much heavier whiskey, the Lagavulin uh, 16, which I will finish off the night with. So that's me all set. I think we've given enough time for everyone to get in. So let me pull up here for you something that I am just, I'm so thrilled with. And it's it's just come together really, really well. And I'm just going to need to share the screen, uh, share a screen, share a window. I want that one. Thank you. And that should have worked. There we go. Let me just change that screens width a little bit just to get rid of some of the dead space. There we go. All right. Battleground Melbourne. Uh, now, can I, uh, if I just get rid of that overlay, there we go. <clears throat> Battleground Melbourne. Goodness. The computer is conspiring against me. There we go. Battleground Melbourne, the fall of the world's most livable city through the eyes of those who tried to save it. I'm already editing that. The word tried is going to be replaced with the uh, words risked all through the eyes of those who risked all to save it. Uh, it's fundraising now. It is a feature length documentary, my first. So if you think about the work that I've done in the past and different Different people are familiar with different things from me, so I don't want to assume that anyone is familiar with any particular thing, uh, but at the same time, if I am repeating things that you already know about, I apologize. It's just, it, it, it's kind of got to be done. 
So my most recent work before now would have to be my most recent work on the Murray-Darling Basin. And you'd be familiar with, uh, with that. They're all sort of between anywhere from seven to about 15 minutes long. Three out of the four of them are me presenting information. I researched the crap out of that subject. I crafted a storyline that was what I believed you really needed to know in order to really wrap your head around that issue and really understand that issue. This was the stuff that you needed to know. Uh, and then I delivered that as quickly as I possibly could because I'm aiming for a YouTube audience that is a very low commitment audience. And the problem with YouTube audiences um, is they've got an infinite amount of other content that they could be watching. So easily distracted, easy for them to click away and do something else. Uh, and that means that you've really got to just get in there, right, and deliver information. And so that's been the driving consideration of most of my content. If you look at 50 to 1, if you look at the Lifestyle Regulation Madness series, if you look at my earlier uh, Unpopular View series, like it's it's all pretty much oriented around this idea that I don't have all that long with people, uh, less so even nowadays than when I first started. When I first started, I was able to be a bit more relaxed. Um, but it's, it's all oriented around this kind of hurry, hurry, deliver the information kind of stuff. The beauty of a, a feature, and I'm, I'm actually really looking forward to this, is that it gives me permission to tell a story and to craft an emotion, to create moments within this documentary. Because when people are sitting down to watch a feature documentary, they're doing it with a much higher level of commitment. As a viewer, you've made a choice. It's not something you stumbled across, most likely. You made a choice. I'm going to sit down, I'm going to watch that 90-minute movie or documentary or whatever it's going to be. And that gives you a lot more freedom to be able to actually create something far more powerful and far more emotional. And if you if you watched the um, Where Does Our, um, Do You Really Want to Know Where Our Food Comes From video, which was the fourth part of my most recent four-part series on the murray Daly Basin. So the first three were me delivering data and information. Rat -tat 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 -tat. The fourth one was where I actually just did it purely out of interviews. And I interviewed four or was it five different farmers and just simply told the story through their words. Actually, I think it was four farmers and a pastor of a church. And I told the story simply out of their words, simply using what they said to me and told that story. And, and in my opinion, that's a very powerful piece. And, and the feedback that I've had on that is incredibly positive. And this feature documentary is much more oriented that way. I want to be sitting down. I've already had confirmations from, from some people and others I'm expecting confirmations from that they're in. I can tell you, for example, that Rukshan is in. Uh, I can tell you that Matt Lawson, who was the first person to be shot with a rubber bullet um, and was shot at point blank range and he was wearing only a T-shirt, the injuries that he sustained were, were absolutely awful. Uh, he's in and he's agreed. Uh, I have a police officer who's agreed. Uh, I have a mental health counselor who's agreed. I have a politician who's agreed. I have a number of people. Some of them will be names that you know. Some of them will be new to you. But these are all people that have agreed to come on and to be a part of this and uh, sorry i just realized i'm getting all these comments and i haven't been keeping up with them um michael angelico says uh feel, <coughs> feel special tonight I, I picked this over the live streams of both discernible and Ka uh, caldron pool i wish there were more nights in the week so we didn't have to sort of compete for eyeballs uh, but i do appreciate that michael thank you um danny says congrats on the doco thank you um yay cigar time absolutely um yeah, Wolfgang is pointing out the problem. Topher Field, MCJ, and the other side all premier premiering at the same time. Look, we all do our own thing. People kind of assume because we're often on the same, um, uh, similar kind of path politically that we're all like best chums and talking to each other. Well, we get along just fine, but it's not like we're comparing notes with each other all the time. So unfortunately, this does happen. Um, so da, 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 da. Joanne is asking me to change the name, say Melbourne, the battle for the most livable city, because it is, uh, it's been and still is a battle. The city isn't lost and never will be. I agree, but I actually, um, and, I, and if I'd not done any polling, I would have called it that. But I did do polling for the same reason that every other company does market research, because you need to find what your audience is going to respond to. Uh, and by a, a ratio of about, uh, about three to one, people responded much better to the fall of rather than the battle for. So that's why I've gone with that, uh, because ultimately this documentary is useless unless people watch it. 
And to get people to watch it, there's an element of clickbaitism. There's an element of having to use the language that is going to evoke that response where people choose to to watch it. So um, where do I get these cigars? Look up a mob on Facebook called The Cigar Professor. Uh, it may just happen that I'm half of that mob. Um, so uh, yeah, you can talk to us there. Uh, love a good single malt. So do I. Uh, Hannah is saying, yay, so excited. Uh, thank you, Hannah. Um, yeah, Joanna says a perfect title now that I see it, but through the eyes of those saving it. Yeah, so that's that's where I'm I'm I am more willing to change the languages towards the end of the byline rather than at the start. So we'll we'll talk about that later as I, as I go through. Uh, Ricky says uh, my MDB work was brilliant. Thank you very much, Ricky. I do appreciate that. Uh, and uh, Tracy agrees, do an awesome job on the MDB uh, A as well. Uh, thank you for my presentation up in Griffith. Uh, that was yeah, that was a little while. Ago. That was. 2021 must be wrong. I think you mean 2019. I was in Griffith. Uh, I think that was. Anyway, uh, Michael says 50 to 1 was amazing. Thank you. Um, it's not lost. Still in the process of being saved. Please put don't, don't put Dan on the cover. Put yourself and some protesters on it. Positive people who are saving it, not destroying it like Dan. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, we had to work with the artwork that we had access to. The problem is the, the photographs, unsurprisingly, the photographs of the protesters uh, tend to be pretty chaotic, tend to be pretty blurry, uh, tend to have some pretty big issues. Um, so from a graphic design point of view and just creating a poster that, that kind of grabbed people's attention. And remember, this isn't just for the people of Melbourne. This is for an international audience that we, we need to get our story out around the world. And they don't have an allergic reaction to Daniel Andrews the way that we do. We've seen way too much of that face. Uh, but he doesn't um, He doesn't actually, yeah, um, Joanne's yeah, saying that the Dan's picture is actually a trigger. Yes, it is. Um, but the fact is that he is kind of the central character of the story. I'm sorry. Uh, John is saying he's in. Thank you. I'll actually, I should post the, um, let me just do that now. So if you do want to support Battleground Melbourne, uh, I have just thrown in the, to the comments, uh, the givesendgo.com fundraiser. And I want to talk, let's start with that. Why did I pick Give, Send, Go as opposed to Patreon or any of these ones when I'm doing a crowdfunding campaign? Quite simply because uh, most of these platforms are now becoming notorious for deplatforming uh, anything that they disagree with. And I've experienced this before many years ago. This has got to be nine years ago now. I did a crowdfunding campaign for a series um, called The Forbidden History. And I was deplatformed because the one about taxes was opposed to Julia Gillard's carbon tax. And I dared to call it a carbon tax instead of an emissions trading scheme. And the people that owned the platform took exception to that and quite literally deplatformed me, kicked me off their platform uh, and, and refunded everything that I'd raised up to that point and gave me a really hard time. So um, uh, I've had to go to an offshore platform somewhere that is not on, in Australia, uh, that is not sensitive to our politics and has its own policy where basically if I'm not... Um, if I'm not breaking the law, you know, if I was engaging in like child porn or something like that, then obviously, yes, they're going to deplatform me. Um, but I checked with them specifically. I said, this is the project. This is what I'm doing. Are you going to deplatform me? Uh, and they said, nope, we're, we're fine with that. We are a free speech platform. And uh, because you're standing up for, for free speech, we, we have no uh, issue with what you're doing. Uh, so just uh, so thank you, Sharon. I appreciate the donation. It says, can't wait for history to be told truthfully. That is the aim. So a couple of things. Firstly, that's why I chose that particular platform. It is an American platform. Uh, I would have loved to have picked an Australian platform. There is no Australian platform that I'm aware of that I could trust to not bow to the political pressure and deplatform me. So that's why I had to, uh, I had to go overseas. Um, oops, there we go. I'm in and donated. Says Joe. Thank you, Joe. I really appreciate that. In terms of the the poster and the name, the title. Um, keep in mind, as I mentioned, as I alluded to a moment ago, this is designed for an international audience. We we don't just need a bunch of Melbourneites sitting around and watching this. That doesn't really help us. What we need are two things. We need people that disagree with us watching. That's hard to do. And I have plans on how this is going to evolve. The artwork is not final, by the way. The artwork, that's our launch artwork. The artwork is going to evolve as this project evolves. The name may change. Um, probably the byline will change. I'll, I'll be adjusting details in the byline as I as my market research gets deeper. 
The title of the actual documentary, Battleground Melbourne, is probably set in stone now, uh, but the byline will be adjusted. The artwork will be adjusted. All of that is work in progress as we go forward. Uh, and making sure that we get seen by two main demographics, the people that disagree with us and people outside of Victoria. It has to appeal not just to the people that have been hurt by Daniel Andrews, because as much as, as, much as I love you guys, um, you're not the people that I need to convince. I, I don't need to change your mind. I don't need you to get you on board and get you to join the fight. You're already there. I need to get people that don't agree with us or aren't aware of what's going on to actually get on board. So we've got a question from Lita saying, um, looking forward to it. What's your time frame for release? The target is pre-Christmas. The target is pre-Christmas to uh, to get this out so that people are watching it over the Christmas, New Year, etc. Keep in mind, there's a federal election coming up in either March, April, or May of next year, um, and doing a lot of damage to Dan before that election um, may get interesting because my hope is, and as, as anyone that follows me, you know, I'm constantly trying to push people towards the minor parties. I'm not trying to get people to leave the Labor Party and vote Liberal. I think it's two, shade, two different shades of shit. Uh, and there's really not a substantial difference between those two. Um, and I, I want to see I want to see a hung parliament. That's what I'm, I, I think the, the way forward politically for us is for neither Liberal National nor the Labor Greens to be able to form government. And they have to come and negotiate with some crossbenchers who are actually in favour of liberty uh, and freedom. That's, that's really w what we need to get to. So December is my target. These things are unknown. And I'm going to talk tonight... Uh, for those of you that have always been fascinated by the film industry, documentaries and films are, are substantially different, but the overall process they follow is actually kind of similar, pre-production, production, post-production. Post and I'm going to talk through what's involved in all of that and some of the considerations that go into that, just, I guess, to, to help sort of you guys get on the same page so that as you watch, as we go through this process of creating this documentary, I'm going to be leaking things. I'm going to be showing you some of the interviews that happen. I'm going to be giving you a bit of insight into the process that's involved uh, and the more on board you guys are and the more you guys can understand what it is that's going on uh, and what's involved in actually doing something like this, then the, the, the I guess the, the, the better, the more of a team we can be. There are some things that I do need from you, not just funds, right? Uh, funds are important. We'll talk about where that goes and, and why films and documentaries and stuff are as expensive as they are. But I need information from you guys because I don't remember everything that's happened. Let me give you an example. I was talking to someone the other day and I said to them, oh, you remember when uh, we were being told that face masks were unnecessary for non-healthcare um, workers? And if you wore one as a non-healthcare worker, well, that was just a waste of a face mask. Dude. Like, do you remember that? And, and because it, I've been reminded of it only recently and they looked at me funny and they were like, yeah, that's right. That did happen. And I think most of us, there's, there's I mean, that's just one example, but there's so many things along the way that have just become, have gotten lost in the fog of, of, of the last 18 months. So I literally, I'm, I'm gonna need you guys to help me remember. I can go back through all my posts that I've done on my Facebook page, but I'm not, I'm not, you know, posting 20 times a day, every little minute things that ha thing that happens. There's a lot that I, I never post about at all. So I'm going to need you guys, and I'll set up a thread for this at, at some stage, to actually help me to remember some of these key policy decisions, some of the media moments that have happened, the lies that have been told, some of the events that have happened, different people that tried to start their businesses, for just as a for instance, okay? At different times, different people have tried to start their businesses. I need to remember and I need to be able to contact some of those people and find some of them that want to be in the docker and, and want to talk to us about what they did and what the reaction was and what happened, the police reaction and everything else. Um, you know, there's there's so much detail here and I can't hope to remember it. I've already got a team researching for me. Uh, we're do, they're doing that on spec. Uh, they'll only get paid if the, the documentary actually gets its minimum budget. Um, so I really appreciate their faith in the project to be, to be doing that at the moment on spec. And then uh, once we get budget, then we'll be able to pay them for their ongoing work. But we've already commenced the building the basic timeline, but then we need to flesh that out with a lot of the detail. So let me talk you through the process a little bit. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. Right. It's telling me that it needs to be smoked a fraction more than what I have been. Yeah, Joe's obviously just looked at the campaign saying I'm up to 9%, not bad. It's <coughs> in six hours, six six hours from launching the campaign. 
I'm at 9% already, which is absolutely phenomenal. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to everyone that's donated. Every little bit helps. Um, but someone just recently came in with a thousand dollar donation, which obviously helps a lot. Uh, so, so I'm, I'm just so grateful to everyone that is, uh, is helping. Uh, Ricky is saying that, uh, we can count on her to get all the guys in the party to share it around. That will be much appreciated. Obviously, once we launch it, we need to be seen by a lot of people in order for it to have the effect that we need it to have. Um, duh, 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 duh. I will enjoy that cigar. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate that. Uh, love how you take long drags. No, it's it's because I'm not actually, I'm not dragging as frequently as I should and therefore it ends up getting too cold. And I have to, it's not ideal. You don't get the best flavors that way. It's not a good technique, but. Like now I'm getting nothing. Yep, it's actually gone out of me. All right, I'm going to put that down for a second. Let me talk about the process of making a film or making a documentary and, and just kind of talk you through how this even works. There are three very distinct phases. They are simply called pre-production, production, post-production. Post um, Ashley says, what's the cigar Facebook page? It's called The Cigar Professor. Myself and a business partner up in Sydney. Um, Steve is uh, offering his help for audio engineering and sound production. Thank you. Uh, we, we will talk. Um, that's called a flame out. Yep. Uh, it is called the flame out. Um, all right. So pre-production, <clears throat> production, post-production. And simply put, production is the bit where you're using a video camera or a film camera. Everything before you pull the camera out is pre-production and everything after you put the camera away is post-production, right? It, it, can, it pretty much breaks down like that. <clears throat> so in the case of this documentary, Production is the period of time while we're doing all of our interviews with all the various people, while we're getting uh, extra footage around the city, maybe of laneways or various locations where um, some of the violence has happened and things like that. We might get some shots of those empty or shots of those normally, um, because again, we're talking to an international audience. They don't know these locations. And so showing them these locations before they then see what actually happened in those locations is potentially valuable. But then also my job is to as the narrator is to tie the whole documentary together. And so there's probably going to be some stuff with me walking around the city, talking about the city. I've lived here since I was two years old. I've lived in, I don't know, it wouldn't be a dozen, but it'd be approaching a dozen different houses around Melbourne and literally the West, the North, the, the, the uh, inner East, the outer Southeast. I've kind of covered the gamut. Um, and so having me kind of talking about Melbourne and what Melbourne is and what Melbourne was, what Melbourne was in the 1980s when I was born and grew up here, I think I, think I won the lottery. You know, being born here in 1982, it's like winning a lottery. Um, but um, it, this this place is not the same as what it was when I was born here. It's it's changed a lot over the decades, and it's especially changed in the last year and a half. So, all of that filming that we do, that is called production. But in order for that to go smoothly, there's a huge amount of organisation required. So just as a, for instance, I sit down to interview somebody, I have to know the right questions to ask that person. I have to know what was their involvement? What's, why are they even here being interviewed? I have to know, are they someone who was involved in a protest and were a victim of police violence? Are they someone who got arrested for doing a Facebook post that was not appreciated? What is it that we're actually, why are we even talking to this person? So there's a huge amount of work that gets done in pre-production in order to prepare. You're scheduling everybody, so a lot of admin type work, you're, you're booking all the equipment, renting all the equipment, hiring the studio space, booking transport for people that need to come in from out of Melbourne or accommodation for people that need to stay overnight, etc. There's just this massive admin burden. But with a documentary, in addition to that, but with a film, you've got a script. And the director then sits down and visualizes with the director of photography, visualizes the script and figures out how they're going to shoot everything. Every single shot is premeditated. With a documentary, it works a little bit differently. Instead of having a script, what we have in this case is a timeline of all of the things that have happened. And the key role that I have in pre-production is to sit down and figure out what is the story that we're telling here? Because there's too much. There is way too much for me to be able to fit everything into a single doco. It's ridiculous. It would just be a mess. So the art of what I do, and I've said this for many years, the art of what I do is what I choose to leave out. Even from my very first video, which was talking about the desalination plant in Wonthaggy, who it was supposed to save Melbourne from uh, the, the millennium drought, as it was back then, uh, and a comparison between that and a dam on the Mitchell River. The art of that particular video were the rabbit holes that I didn't go down, the things that I chose not to say. 
And every single thing that I chose to say and every single thing that I left in was done for a reason. There was a specific reason why that thing was still in. That's the art of telling any story. That's the art of writing a script for a feature film. It's the art of researching for a documentary. That's that's the whole art of storytelling. So the pre-production process, from my perspective, I'll have a producer who'll be doing a lot of the logistical legwork, booking equipment, booking people in to get interviewed, doing a lot of that sort of stuff. My job is to sit down with the research team. That, Like I said earlier, they've already started. They've put a lot of faith in this project and they've already started uh, doing the research on spec. Not even, not even sure that they're going to get paid for it because if we don't get funded, it doesn't go ahead. So we're in a situation where, where my pre-production is going to be sitting down with the researchers, going through the timeline with a fine tooth comb and figuring out exactly what are the building blocks of this story. What's the story that we're telling? Now, what we're telling, of course, is the story of what's happened over the last 18 months from the perspective of the you know, people like me, people like uh, Rukshan, people like Matt Lawson, uh, you know, people who have tried to stop it from happening or tried to get a better outcome than what has actually happened. And what that means is there's a lot that, that actually just ends up getting left out. There just isn't time to put it all in there. And we have to make sure that the things that we put in, that we give time to, are building and constructing a narrative, a story arc that someone who knows nothing about what happened in Melbourne, knows nothing about who we are, where we are, what we're like, can sit down and watch it. And it feels like a cohesive story that goes from, you know, has a start, a middle and an end uh, and makes sense to them. And they finish it and they go, wow, that was, that was an incredible story. So that's my job in pre-production is to design the story. And I'll have a team around me that's doing a bunch of other much more technical sort of stuff. It's as the director, it's not my job to get involved in the technical stuff. It's it's my job to have, you know, I'll have a producer who recruits and hires and pays people to do all the technical stuff. It's my job to design the story. Then we will hit production. Now, this is the actual filming. <clears throat> And the first part of production is going to be sitting down with people doing interviews with them. So we will have, at the moment, we, we've got a list of about 20 people that we either have or we're, we're looking for. Um, it's particular profiles, particular you know, people whose businesses have been shut down, people whose mental health has been harmed, uh, people who, yeah, I, I won't go too much into detail, but we're looking for specific people that fit specific profiles. And to then sit down and interview them. And, and because of the research that I have to do in pre-production, I'm able to sit down with them and ask intelligent questions that relate directly to their own personal experiences with all of this. But then also we're going to have some things, we're going to be asking some people to comment on events that happened. So, you know, for example, the woman who got pushed over, the woman in the red jacket who got pushed over uh, by a senior sergeant and then pepper sprayed in, in the face. We want certain people to comment on that because we'll be using that commentary instead of me being the one always doing the commenting. Uh, we can show people this collateral and, and they can comment uh, and that just makes it much more interesting for the viewers. It's not my voice. It's it's everybody's voices, everyone mixed in together. Um, and so being organized to then know what people do we want, what comments on what issues and so forth, and having all that preparation. So that becomes production. We sit there with video cameras in a studio. We interview person after person after person. And all the while, and, I, and this is what I used to do in the corporate world, by the way, it was I, I do corporate videos where we had to interview CEOs and interview different people, uh, boring people that had terrible media skills. And I then had to turn it into a wonderful corporate video for them. And so I'm editing in my head <clears throat> as I'm listening and as I'm hearing what they're saying. And ultimately, my job is to try and get to the point where we've got the story really well covered 95% without me, right? 95% of the story is covered by the people that I've interviewed and the other footage that we've sourced. Uh, so while we're in production and I'm doing the interviews, my team, my research team is taking all of the various things uh, that have been selected by me to be part of the story, all the different events, and they're going and finding all of the news media footage, all of the speeches in parliament that relate to it, all of the print media stuff, all of the social media footage, uh, anything that trended online as a result of it. They're trying to find all of that collateral and then put that into a folder on a computer so that when we're editing and we get to this particular subject, I've got this lovely big grab bag of stuff, of collateral to show the incident, to show the reaction to the incident, to show how the media reported the incident, to show how politicians discussed the incident. And all of that is just sitting there ready for me when we hit post-production. So we'll have the research team all the way through production. They're doing that in the background while I'm sitting down with the interviewees and actually getting them to tell the story and to tell the narrative. Then the very last thing that happens in production in this particular documentary 
is going to be me sitting down. It's going to take a couple of days. There'll be a couple of day break in production. It's going to take a couple of days of going through the footage from the interviews that we've got and figuring out what's missing. What are the bits that we just never, no one ever quite said it quite the right way, all right? We, we're trying to segue from talking about the political reaction to the media reaction, but no one ever quite said the right things. It kind of leads you from one to the other. And that's where I then have to do my bit as the narrator, as the host of the documentary. I then make some sort of a comment about from, from you know, p- political response to media response to whatever it may be, and, and, and that gets written. And then I sit in a studio for a day and I film all those little bits, the opening, the closing, and all the different little segue bits in between. Anything that we just couldn't get exactly what we needed from the people that we interviewed. So what that then means is by the end of production, we've got hours upon hours of interviews. We've got hundreds of different bits of footage, whether it was social media streamed footage, news file footage, stuff from Parliament screen grabs from people's social media accounts, whatever it may be, whatever's relevant to that particular issue. And then we begin post-production. And this is where a series of events happen uh, in, in, and the order is is pretty, pretty important. Now, Sharon has asked me, uh, can people who might contribute remain anonymous? Absolutely. On the platform, I'll just post the link again. On the platform, um, you have the option to not put your name. So, um, yeah, so you can be absolutely, and I don't even see it. If you if you choose that option, no one knows. Only the platform knows, and, and they're never going to tell me. Um, Michael's saying that there's echoes. Uh, I have heard that before from people saying there's echoes. I don't understand why that could possibly be, but hopefully, hopefully the audio is okay. Um, so we hit post-production. Now, post-production is probably the most fixed in terms of how it functions. Every project's pre-production and production is different depending on the needs of the project. Post-production is pretty much, it is what it is. And it begins with the assembly of the edit. Just getting all the story blocks into place and just going, do we have a story? Do we need to grab the camera again and go and film something additional because we missed something? Uh, and this happens all the time with feature films, by the way, right? They, they they wrap up, they think they're finished filming, and then they start to put it together and they go, we don't have coverage of this. We don't have the shot of that particular actor in this particular moment and we need it. And then they call the actor back and they hope he hasn't cut his hair or she, uh, and they get him back into the same outfit and back into the set and they film this one shot, usually not even with the same actors opposite them. Like it's just because you can only see the one actor, you can't see the others. And then that has to edit in and splice in perfectly. So the first thing you do is 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 a rush edit, a rough cut edit. And uh, that then just tells you, all that tells you is, do I have everything that I need? Do I need to film anything more or are we done with the camera? We can put that away and leave it away and move forward. So hopefully, fingers crossed, we'll have everything that we need. And from there, once the blocks are in place, then you need an editor. And I don't mean someone who cuts together home movies. Editing is an art. And I'm... I'm okay. I'm a functional editor. I can edit a corporate video. I am not editing this documentary. I don't have the the sixth sense. There is an art. They say that a movie gets made three times. It gets made by the person who writes it. It gets remade by the person who directs it. And it gets made a final time by the person who edits it. The editor has a phenomenal influence. And it's, it's the obvious stuff like pacing, right? There are times when you, wanna, you want your shot count to rise. You, you're doing more edits per minute, more edits per second uh, in, say, an action sequence rather than a, a, a love sequence or whatever it may be. Uh, in a documentary, you might want to push through a certain subject and build tension towards a confrontation. But then when you've got an interview with someone who's talking about the emotional impact of what's happened, you want to slow right down. And so they've got to have that. That's the obvious stuff. But there's much more subtle things around the exact timing of edit points, you know, and, and, and just those moments. So someone says something and just letting it hang on those words for an extra 10 frames, an extra 15 frames, there's 24 frames a second. So, you know, an extra 24 frames, an extra second before you then cut away, all of a sudden gets the audience to reflect on what they were saying. And it's the combination of the two. You build, you pace, 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 increase, pace, increase, pace, increase intensity, and suddenly you let it breathe on a particular statement that someone has made. And it has a massive impact. And that's the art. And I'm not, I'm not a master of that art at all. So we need a top line. We've got someone in mind, um, but we need the budget to be able to hire a really top level documentary editor who has that art uh, down to a, to a, 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 you know, has perfected that particular art form. Once the editing's done, 
so it's all all of the interviews and everything, but then all of the the B-roll, all of the news footage, the file footage, the stuff that we find online, overlaying motion graphics. So because this is a documentary designed for an audience that hasn't seen Melbourne, they've probably never been here. Most people that are going to watch this have never been here. If we get watched by a couple of million people around the world, most of them don't know Melbourne at all. So we need maps to be able to illustrate where we've gone. And that can't just be a, a screenshot from Google Maps, which is what I use on my low budget productions. This has to be a properly animated map, it has to kind of sweep in from the sky and 3D buildings and overlays of different stuff. Like it's got to look good. Everything has to look and feel engaging. So you need a motion graphics artist to do that. And motion graphics is something that people really underappreciate the hours involved. Every little bit that you see moving on the screen was time. Someone had to sit there and plot the pathway for that particular thing to happen and time it correctly for, for the edit and what was going on. So all that has to happen. And then once that is done, you eventually reach a stage called picture lock. And what that means is the edit is, is locked. You are no longer going to move anything, not even by a single frame. And that's crucially important for a number of reasons. Um, and for us, picture lock is going to be probably around about three weeks before launch. Once we reach picture lock, that's when we're going to really be able to plan and schedule and know we can launch in about three weeks. The remaining three weeks after you've locked the picture, nothing is allowed to change. Not a single frame can be moved. A number of simultaneous processes can begin. One is color grading. So color grading is where they go through and they, they just adjust your color saturation, your hue, your contrast, your white balance. And they're trying to make sure that the picture is visually interesting, it's engaging. Um, in the case of a documentary where you're using a lot of really low quality footage, they're just trying to recover the best outcome they can recover from really crappy, grainy phone footage or whatever it might be. Um, but also then for the studio stuff where it's really high quality, there's a lot of color depth, they can just fine tune skin tones and make sure that everyone looks the best that they can look. But also there's, there's continuous continuity. You're not going from one person in a studio who looks dark and then another person in a studio where bang, it's all of a sudden really bright. They're just making sure that from edit to edit, from, from person to person, shot to shot, there's no really jarring kind of stuff going on. It's a fairly important process. It's one of those things that you don't notice if they've done it right, but you definitely notice if they've done it wrong. Simultaneous with that, you've got someone doing the audio grade and they're basically doing the same thing. They're balancing out the audio levels. They're taking, you know, one person's voice might have been a bit thin or it might be some phone uh, video footage where the audio is really low quality and they're trying to, they're running effects and filters and processes over the top of that to try and get the best result that they can out of the audio and then take the result and then balance the audio so that people aren't reaching for the remote and turning it up and turning it down uh, and that sort of stuff. It's once, once someone finds that volume that they're happy with, it just continues on at that perfect volume all the way through. Then simultaneous with that, you've also got a composer who is then designing the music. And music is one of those things that, that I certainly, as a filmmaker 20 years ago, when I first dipped my toe in the water, I massively underappreciated the importance of the music and the composer. And with documentaries, I think it's doubly important because you don't have the benefit of a script and actors and this beautifully designed set and everything else to really immerse your viewers as you do in a feature film. Everything's created, everything's made for purpose in a feature film. In a documentary, you've got to use what you've got, what you can find. So the music becomes the main way that you invite people into the world of the documentary and you you it, it sets the tone, it sets the pace, it, it helps viewers take the journey through the rises and the falls, the intense moments, the confrontations, the emotional moments. And uh, we've got a composer already signed up who I'm super thrilled about uh, because he's a freaking gun. He's amazing. Uh, and he needs three full weeks to do the music on this documentary from start to finish. And it's just such an important part of it. Then, of course, while post-production is happening, all of your collateral gets made as well. So you, we need not just the, the doco. Um, so uh, Joe says, oh, I, I thought he was after a video editor by the sounds of things. I'm after a lot of people, um, but I'm after genuine um, industry professionals. You know, and, and I have a number of them because of my history and the work that I've done in the past. There's a few spots that we have yet to fill. Um, and so whilst I appreciate people sort of wanting to put their hand up and say, hey, I can I can help, um, I'm going to need to see a resume and I'm going to need to see some of your work because I'm not raising this budget to to then hand that budget over to people that can do a good job. I'm handing that budget over to the best people that I can possibly afford that are going to do an awesome job and make this one of those documentaries that people remember and look back on for a very long time. So I'm going to be very picky about the people that I bring on and how that money and how that budget gets spent because I owe it to you guys to deliver 
an absolutely outstanding result. Not a good result, an outstanding result. So while all that post-production is happening, the audio grade, the color grade, the music uh, composition is going on. We've also got graphic artists working on all of the collateral that goes around it. So um, everything from uh, Instagram posts and Facebook posts, website banners, actual posters potentially to go up physically to distribute to people just to put up around the place to say, hey, this thing exists and you can watch it on this platform. All of that has to be designed. The marketing obviously has is planned all the way from pre-production. We already, the, the marketing plan is in place. So in post-production, as we approach the launch date, all of the marketing actually um, then starts to roll up and actually starts to get rolled out. So there's a tease campaign that comes out where we start leaking little bits and pieces of the documentary in short, little easily digested bites for people to watch. And that's happening all the way up to the um, to the actual launch of the documentary. I've got a great question here from um, from James. Um, how do we contact you regarding if our story is worth telling? I'm just going to put my uh, email address, uh, tofer at toferfield.net. Uh, yes, dangerous putting your email address publicly uh but that is the way to contact me uh and i'm very happy if you've if something has happened to you whatever it may be whether it's mental health impact whether it's financial impact um whether it's it's human rights issues health issues whatever has happened to you if if you think that it might be worth including um and you're willing obviously to to be included and if you need to be, if your identity needs to be kept secret, that can be arranged. We would still want to interview you, but we would interview you in a manner where you're you're not able to be seen and your voice is changed. And we're doing that with uh, with some people who are in fairly sensitive positions that want to come on the documentary and want to um, not set the record straight. They, in a way, I, I feel as though with at least one of them, it's almost a confessional. Uh, they're almost just wanting that they, they, they've just got to pour their heart out anyway. Um, so yes, if you want to, uh, if you think that something's happened to you, uh, and you, you're interested and you're willing to be a part of it, then please, uh, do just send me an email, tofer at toferfield.net. Please don't be offended if I decide not to include your particular story there. We're talking about 18 months of some of the most intense history in Victoria. And I'm trying to tell that story in 90 minutes. Uh, I have to make some really brutal decisions about what gets in and what doesn't. Um, and yeah, it's 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 just how it is. And I owe it to everyone that's right now donating to help make this happen to make the best decisions in the interest of the documentary. So please don't, yeah, please just have a light touch when it comes to how you're going to react based on my decision because my decision is going to be based on what's best for the documentary, which doesn't mean that your story isn't worthy of being told. It just may not fit the narrative and the the actual story arc that we're creating in this particular documentary. Um, Graham has asked, uh, does being stuck in Southeast Asia since March 2020 count? Send me an email. Give me, give me a couple of dot point version of your story. Uh, and I can very quickly make a judgment call on that, Graham. So, so please do. Please send me that email. Um, then we finally get to launch. And this is where things get really interesting. I get super nervous before the launch of any of my projects. Really, really nervous. Because I've poured my heart and soul out for however long. It might be you know, on a small project, it might be a couple of weeks on a project like this. It's going to be four months of my life by the time it's done. And I've poured my heart and soul into it and done everything I can. And it just, it feels... Um, I don't know, it, you feel really naked when you're sort of putting that work out there. But anyway, it is what it is and you've got to do it. Like, There's no point in making this stuff and not launching it. So you launch it, you cross your fingers, you hope for the best that people are going to respond well, uh, that it's going to have the desired result. It's going to be convincing or influential in the ways that you hoped that it would be. I mean, all of these things, are, they're made for a purpose. They're not just made for fun. We're telling this story for a reason. And it's really important, obviously, that that when people watch this, that that story comes through and we have the the desired results. So there's all of that going on in my mind when we finally launch. And I'm sitting there going, will people watch it? Will people watch it all the way through to the end? Will they share it? Will they, will they tell other people about it? Is this going to be something that they're going to talk about with someone else at work over a water cooler? Because that's ultimately where we've got to get to. We've got to get to the point where people are having casual conversations about this documentary. That's how, that's how these things go viral. Yes, they go viral online through social media and everything else. But they also go viral because people bring it up when they go to a barbecue at their mate's place. Obviously not in Melbourne because that's not happening here. But in parts of the world where they're not locked down like we are, we've got to make this the water cooler conversation. And that involves obviously the documentary being fantastic, but it also involves the collateral being really enticing and really interesting. And that's why I say that banner that you've seen, that's our first attempt. 
That's the first effort. And I think it's sensational. I think my graphic designer has done a wonderful job on that. But now we're watching all the feedback. We're listening to what people are saying. We're thinking about the implications of certain changes to the wording, to the imagery, even to the color tone. We picked a very purple color scheme for this one. Is that the right color scheme? None of that stuff's locked in yet. And it's all going to be adapted and adjusted through this journey because it effectively amounts to market research. As you guys give me feedback and as I encounter feedback from others that aren't a part of my own audience, which often is actually more useful, um, no, no offense to you guys, but people who don't know who I am, when they see some of my work, they're going to give me a pretty blunt and brutal assessment of it. Um, so, so taking all of that into account, that then informs changes. And we've got a couple of months to get that right. But by the time we launch, we have to have that right because that collateral is really, really crucial in getting people to just be scrolling Facebook and they see an ad flash up in front of them and they, they scroll back to it and they go, what was that? And that's the reaction that we need to evoke. And then um, some shorter edits of the documentary. So we can offer a three minute version right? That just is, is a punchy, it's just a single little storyline out of the overall documentary that we can then promote as an ad, push it out on YouTube, push it out on Facebook, paid advertising if we've got budget, obviously not if we get only get the minimal budget, but if we get, you know, the full budget that we ideally would need. I mean, if we were, um, if we were, um, if this was a commercial project and I was quoting on it, I would quote $210,000 and not a dollar less. I'd actually probably quote more just to build a bit of margin into it. But $210,000, that's the actual budget if I was quoting on this project commercially. And I know that because I spent four years as a producer in a, in a video production company where I did quote on jobs commercially. I'm My minimum budget is $65,000. I can do a decent job for $65,000. It's not going to be what I would want it to be, but you would probably watch it and go, yeah, that was, that was pretty good. I would see the deficiencies. I would see where the money could have gone. But most people, because they're not in the industry and they don't know what I didn't do, they only see what I did do, we'd, we'd kind of miss it. So 65000 is really where the ballgame starts. And about 210000 anything above that, I'd, I'd shut off the, the fundraiser at 210000 because after that point in time, I'm not convinced that we would be offering a huge return on people's in, you know, um, donation into the project. But up to 210000 it's giving us marketing budget. It's, you know, and think about, think about marketing, not in the usual, not, not just in the normal sense, obviously in the normal sense. Yes. Uh, Facebook ad spend, YouTube ad spend, Instagram ad spend, you know, the, the cost of creating all the collateral that you're then going to use in those advertising campaigns, someone managing those advertising campaigns, A, B, testing different language. Uh, what if we use this particular um, clickbaity headline? What if we use that particular one? You know, which ones are working better in which markets and with different demographics? A lot, there's a lot of A-B testing and there's people's time involved in managing and watching and killing off the, the ad campaigns that aren't converting and keeping and in, in increasing the, the volume, the money behind the ad campaigns that are. But then given that this is a film product, there's also going and trying to get... Um, this onto, let's say, Netflix or, or Amazon or something. Now, they probably wouldn't pay us for it, um, but we might be able to get one of them or more of them, more than one of them potentially, to host it and to actually have it as part of their suite of documentaries that they offer. Uh, probably won't be a source of income for us, but it's another uh, channel for this to go out and to find an audience that it wouldn't have necessarily found any other way. And that involves people, and it would probably be my producer, uh, going to places like uh, South by Southwest Film Festival and things like that. And, and they go there already anyway. We're not paying them to go. That's not coming out of the budget of the film. Um, but they would have this project as part of the portfolio of projects that they're now trying to sell or trying to try to place. In the case of this one, where, where it, there's no money in it, um, but but that does cost money and we would need to pay them for their trouble of including this in their, their suite of projects that they're then trying to push and promote and so forth. So there's a there's the whole um, uh, marketing side of it. Uh, I hate making a project and just putting it out there into the world and having absolutely no way of influencing its destiny from, from that moment on. I much prefer to have a, a marketing budget to work with. So that's my hope for this. Okay. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Now, someone asked earlier, there it is, Peter Clay, where do you plan to release the documentary? Fantastic question. In a nutshell, everywhere. All right. So Rumble, YouTube, Facebook, you know, of course, like we're going to put it on all the big platforms, but we know the censorship problem. We know that they're going to nitpick something that someone says partway through and ban the whole thing off Facebook or whatever else because they go, oh, well, that person said something that we disagree with. It's probably actually accurate, um, but Facebook have decided that they're wrong. So that will probably get banned off them, uh, which is what Tyson's pointing out. You know, you have the issue of getting banned off the big platforms, 100%. So it'll also be hosted on Rumble and you know, all the alternative sort of platforms where we know that it's going to remain, okay? 
it might get banned off YouTube, it might get banned off Facebook, but there are certain platforms that it won't get banned from, but we're going to release it onto all of them to start with. Then try and get it onto some of the big commercial platforms. You know, talking to SBS Vice, for example, right? They play some pretty interesting stuff. They play some pretty controversial stuff. They play some stuff that isn't necessarily what the government of the day would would want them to publish. They're one of the few that government-funded channels that actually seems to get away with that a little bit. So something like SBS Vice would be really, really interesting. Um, uh, Dober has just asked if I'm uh, familiar with Lemac. Yeah, we deal with Lemac all the time. I have throughout my career. Really good supplier of gear, um, but I've got my own, not my own, but I've got a producer that I've been working with for a number of years now uh, who has a studio in South Melbourne. So I work with him, I hire his gear, I hire his studio, uh, and we work out of his offices. Uh, he's supported me and he's, you know, for example, the um, the most recent little creative fun project that I did, the Infectious Diseases Hall of Fame, he provided me with a bunch of work. He did a, a bunch of work for me on that, provided gear, provided staff, provided office uh, space, uh, was involved in the editing and the post-production, didn't charge me a cent. And so... I reward that by then when I actually get a project that has a budget, that budget goes through him. So he looks after me, I look after him. And in the end, uh, it works out works out really well for both of us. But Lee Mac are a great supplier. And if we need a piece of gear that we don't have, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll talk to Lee Mac for sure. Um, okay, so people are saying, um, also look at some of the smaller conservative platforms in the US, uh, the Christian channels and the radio. Look, we'll look at anyone. I mean, the point of this, the, yeah, this is a good point. Joanne, Sky put Sherry Markson's What Really Happened in Wuhan on their channel. Um, yep, potentially. Now, Sky are coming around. Sky Sky were kind of good early on. Then once the vaccines came out, they went absolute rubbish. It's like they were almost, uh, I don't know, they were trying to appeal to the other channels and be like, oh, see, we're not so bad. We're not so extreme by just being really hard-lined on this whole vaccine thing. It really put me off. Um, but they've recently now they're coming around again. So we'll see where they're at by the time we, we, this launches, but this is launching hopefully in December, as I said earlier, hopefully before Christmas. And it is the, the, the point of it is to get it in front of as many people as possible. It's about as many eyeballs as I can possibly get my hands on. So with that in mind, we're going to launch it onto every single, um, every single platform. Uh, okay, sorry, just I've just had a message actually from my producer, so I'm just checking that quickly to make sure there's nothing urgent. Good, okay. So I've got I'm working into the night. I've got people that are working into the night. We've been working on this now for some time to get it to the point where we can announce it and and launch it. So uh, I'm going to be busy. I'm, I've been busy, and I'm going to be a busy boy for the next sort of three months until this thing actually launches. Okay. Um, okay. So that's the whole production process from start to finish. Budget-wise, I've touched on that. Ultimately, you get what you pay for. This is an industry where you get what you pay for. If I've got $65,000, which is my minimum budget, I have to keep the hours tightly under control in all aspects of production, everything from the research to the color grading to the, the composing and the music at the end. Like Everything has to be really tightly controlled. Um, it may exclude a few potential interviewees that have since left Victoria, but they'd be willing to come back if I could cover their travel costs to come back. If I don't have a lot of budget, then... Uh, I, I don't have that option. So so a bit of money goes there. But also if we only have the 65,000, I don't have any advertising budget. It's literally a case of I make it, I release it, and I cross my fingers and, and hope like hell that it goes well. So my hope is that we're, we're going to exceed that minimum budget. Whether we get to the actual sort of full commercial value budget is neither here nor there. Once we're, once we're past that minimum budget, then it's on. We're going ahead with it. Uh, and and by the time we get to launch date, we'll have whatever budget that we have for, for marketing afterwards. Okay, a couple of other good questions. What's the angle that I plan to take? I am deliberately not coming at this from a neutrality point of view. There's this idea that a documentary always uh, has to be neutral. No, I think a documentary always has to be honest about its viewpoint. If you're not coming from a neutral viewpoint, you need to acknowledge that. And you need to be honest about that as a documentarian. Um, however, you don't have to be neutral. You just have to tell the audience where you're coming from. And where we are coming from is this is through the eyes of the freedom fighters, through the eyes of the people who tried to save their city. And I justify that by saying, well, the government has already put their side of the story, right? Every, the, everything the government says gets all over the media. They get all the coverage. They, they've lied about us, like bald-faced lied about us. And it gets picked up in the media and reported like it's the truth. The media, of course, they've said whatever they've wanted to say. The police have come out with some absolute bullshit and, and been covered in the media as though it's gospel, right? They've already put their side of the story. 
So I don't feel bad about the fact that I'm saying, hey, this is our side of the story. I'm not trying to be neutral in this documentary. I'm telling you, this is our side of the story. This is what it looked like from our point of view. When they said this about us, well, here's the reality on the ground as caught by Rukshan or as caught by Avi or as caught by any of the other people streaming, you know, sitting down and interviewing some of the people that have been given all sorts of horrible labels in the media that have been crucified, demonized, and actually getting them in front of the camera and treating them like a human being. You know, taking people that are being charged now for for assaulting police officers, but in the video footage, you can see they never they never came within two or three feet of a police officer, much less reached out and touched him. And yet they're, they're on charges from the cops right now. You know, so this is a one-sided documentary, and I make no apology for that. We are setting the record straight. We are telling our side of the story. Um, okay, so what's my actual title? I'm the director. Um, ba -ba -bum. 65 grand doesn't seem like much. It's not much. That's the honest truth. Some people think, oh, you know, why do you need that much money? It's not much. That's the honest truth. But I can I can I can do a an online distribution worthy documentary for that amount of money because there's a lot of people willing to help out for below market rates, right? Even though we need to be using professionals, um, uh, and we need to be using people that are really, really good at what they do, we there are a lot of people that agree with us and are willing to do more than they would normally do for a given budget. So because of that, we can kind of make it work for 65 grand. Once I get to about 140, 150 grand, that's where I'm comfortable. Get to 210, happy days. I've got marketing budget that I can work with literally for a year after the launch of the documentary. We can be still able to push it out and market it and, and use it uh, to continue doing damage to, to Daniel Andrews and, and damage to everyone that has, has celebrated this growth in, in government power. Uh, are you putting yourself out there with protests, et cetera, to be arrested as a reason to stop the doco? Um, I'm not sure if that question quite came out the way you intended. I'm actually reducing my activity with the protests. You'll notice that on the weekend, was it just this last weekend? I think it was Saturday. Um, it, <laughs> I was actually walking around for nearly an hour looking for the group, finally found them. Uh, they were walking away from me for a long time. So I'm, I'm looking on Ruxin's footage and I'm walking along and they just kept on going away from me, finally rendezvoused with them. And it was only about eight minutes later that the police moved in. That proved in the end to be a pretty close call for me. I very nearly got grabbed. Uh, my urban camouflage worked very well, uh, which I've talked about in previous slow chats. So some of you will know what reference what I'm referencing and some of you won't. Uh, it's not literal camouflage, don't worry. Um, so I, I literally, the, the next person behind me got grabbed and they got grabbed by four police officers. I could sort of see out of the periphery of my vision. And for whatever reason, none of those officers then came and grabbed me. So that's how close that was. And if I do get grabbed, then it, yeah, it's, it's a problem. Now, it's not going to stop the documentary. Um, I've made sure of that. I've got documentation to make sure that this the documentary will be able to proceed without me. It may get delayed a little bit, but it'll be able to proceed. Um, but in fairness to the fact that now, as of today, there's other people's money involved, uh, I am going to be winding back my activities with protests until after this launches. So just as a preventative measure, as a precautionary measure, because this honestly is more important. I mean, look, when I was first doing the protests in, in starting in April 2020, I was the only one streaming, right? I was, the, I was the only one there who was streaming, who had any kind of an audience. And so the most important thing that I could do was stream. Fast forward a year and a half, there's a lot of people streaming. Ruxin's getting 10 times, more than 10 times the audience that I'm getting most of the time. So what's the point in me also getting out there and streaming? I'm not really helping a lot by doing that. Yes, doing the speeches and... and um, sort of controlling the narrative a little bit through speeches and declaring why we're there. That's a that's a useful thing to do. Uh, but that's not really happening anymore with the way the police are cracking down, the amount of violence that's going on. We're not able to get to the point where we can actually have speeches and do these sorts of things. Uh, and so the narrative is really being set by the signs that people are carrying uh, and the slogans that are chanted. That's really what's setting the narrative now in terms of what these protests are about. So a lot of the value that I brought to the protests early on is diminished. And to be honest, the protests themselves are diminished as well. Um, you know, we had anywhere from five to 10,000 people at our peak, depending on whose estimate you, you believe. Now we've got 150, 200 people because of the amount of violence that the police have brought against these protests. So, um, you know, for me, I think it's, it's a case of changing tactics and changing where I spend my energy to where I think it's actually going to yield the, the biggest result. Early on, that was streaming. 
and then it was giving speeches. And now I think it's this documentary. So I am going to become like, I'm already fairly risk averse. I make no apology for that. I make no bones about that. I'm not out there to get arrested or to get face to face with the cops. If you've watched my live footage, you know that I'm not at the front of the crowd. I'm not that guy. Right. Um, but I think I, I need to actually step back even further uh, from that. So potentially not even actually showing up um, to, to many of the protests now. Um, Cresho, will the Victorian police be extras? Well, they'll certainly be heavily featured. Uh, and um, watch this space. You may well find that there is the shadowed outline of a police officer in uniform with their voice altered, um, spilling the beans on some of what's going on inside the, uh, the police force. So wait and see. Uh, what about the guy that said, I have no skills to do anything else? Look, he's probably already been severely punished for even saying that. They would have identified him based on his voice. Uh, and I think he catches his face at one brief moment or part of his face at one brief moment. Um, so I doubt that he's going to want to talk to me. Um, will I do a re-edit next year as the story continues? Probably more likely a sequel than a re-edit uh, and actually pick up the story then. We need to get this story out as it is now. The world needs to know because the with the world knowing, I mean, I don't know if you've been across all this news, politicians in Poland marched to the Australian embassy in Poland and gave speeches. And it's pretty clear that they understand freedom better than we do. Uh, in New York recently, literally just was it yesterday or the day before, there was a march uh, involving a mix of politicians and ordinary people to the Australian embassy. Uh, again, protesting in solidarity against the human rights abuses that they're seeing in Australia. Now, that, what they don't realise is they're seeing them in Victoria and a little bit outside of Victoria in very you know much more controlled parts of New South Wales and so forth. Yes, they're, they're also happening. But most of what they're seeing is in Victoria. So we need to reach those people and try and increase the amount of that that's going on to put more pressure back on Scott Morrison, more pressure back on Daniel Andrews, to try and get a, a, a better result uh, for all of us. Um, possibly try publishing this overseas first. I can only do what I can to help Australia, but getting info and vids out to overseas has helped. The rest of the world is now watching uh, because of, yeah, well, mostly because of Ruxham, let's be honest. Uh, <laughs> so, oh, by the way, um, thank you for sticking around. Here's a little bonus. Tomorrow night's slow chat is with Ruxham. Uh, which I am tremendously looking forward to. I've been awaiting this day for about six weeks. He's been he's been a busy boy, as you've seen. So um, we have um, I've been had had to wait patiently for him to have time in his life to do it, uh, and he's very kindly agreed to do it tomorrow night. Uh, assuming he doesn't get arrested, assuming there's no big protest that has him out, out, out on his feet all day, so anything like that. So caveat, caveat, caveat. Hence, I haven't advertised it yet. You're the first to hear about it tomorrow, Rukshan, uh, for the slow chat at eight pm. Uh, uh, Therese says uh, 65k is nothing for this kind of doco yes um, Deidre I'm excited uh, about this documentary the truth needs to be told yes it does <laughs> government grants available I wouldn't count on it um, I would not count on it can I touch on Daniel Andrews's current corruption charges I actually can't I'm not across that I've spent the last two days preparing for today and the launch of that so since all of this started to come out again. I mean, we, we know there's corruption there. We saw the whole red shirts thing. We, you know, the branch stacking accusations, there's been so much smoke. We know there's fire. Um, but in terms of what's come back out recently, I actually am not across that at all. So I'm sorry, Iris, I'm not going to touch that, uh, but I will try and get across it in time for tomorrow night's slow chat with Ruxin, uh, so that we can have a bit of a chat about that. Rich Johns says, your fans will market it for you. That's what I'm hoping for. Thank you, Rich. Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, hopefully. Um, officials and mainstream media have told their side the balance is being able to hear these other sides. Absolutely. Uh, and that's what this documentary is designed to do. That's why I don't feel bad about this documentary not itself being balanced. This documentary is designed to bring balance to a very unbalanced conversation. Um, Jess says, are you paying yourself? I hope so. Uh, in the budget, I've got about $5,000 for myself, uh, $5,000 for four months of my life. You do the math. Um, but then again, that's $5,000 more than I normally get for what I do. Um, so <laughs> look, it is what it is. I, I said on a, a chat earlier today on Instagram, you know, people have these, this ridiculous idea that activists like myself, and this goes for the other side as well, right? This doesn't just go for the activists you agree with. This goes for the activists that you disagree with as well. They have this idea that they're in it for the money or the fame or whatever else, right? Listen. I'm 39 years old, and if I had stayed in my corporate career as it was before I left and became Topher, uh, I would now be worth about $160,000 a year, maybe more. Uh, over the last 12 years, I would definitely have earned $700,000 over that journey and, and more as, as time goes forward. 
So right now, um, in in any given year as TOEFL, because I do do some consulting, I do some film work as well for that for you know commercially that I do actually get paid properly for. But in any given year, I might earn about fifty thousand dollars, of which I then have expenses and stuff, and I end up actually with a taxable income and around the twenty five to thirty thousand dollar mark. Compare that to one hundred and sixty thousand dollars. Being TOEFL is costing me over hundred grand a year. Right, it just it just is what it is, but that's also true of other activists. It's true of the people that that I'm on the opposite side of. Right, when when you're cursed with wanting to make the world a better place, when you're naive and romantic enough to think that you can change things, you make stupid decisions like deciding to do what I do instead of just earning lots of money. Um, so it, look, it just is what it is. I'm I'm not that cut up about it. I'm very grateful to those that have decided to actually support me personally through my Subscribestar, subscribestar.com forward slash Topher Field, if that interests you, um, because that's taking the sting out of it. I mean, I'm, I'm now on, I think if you convert it to Australian, I think it's about $1,400 a month, right, from supporters that are supporting me personally and my work personally, uh, which is still below the poverty line. But you know what? It's a hell of a lot better than, than not having that behind me. And it helps to cover some of the costs. I have to pay for all the Adobe um, software that I use. I pay subscriptions for a few other different software packages to manage my email list and to manage different stuff. And now that is actually being assisted and being paid uh, by others, which is nice. So anyway, look, it is what it is. That's that's just how this, when you try and change the world, don't expect to get rich in the process. Uh, okay. How many interviews do you need to do? Um, we're looking for around about 20 people and that's, and I've designed that based on the profile of the people that we need and the kinds of events that we need to cover. So in total, there's going to be close to about 20, uh, Camp Hill Creek says, I don't have a problem with you being a chicken shit. It's for a great cause. <laughs> uh, thank you. I appreciate the, uh, I appreciate the encouragement. I don't know. Uh, Melbourne camouflage equals puffer jackets. Uh, Melbourne camouflage equals takeaway cup of coffee. That one's free. You want any more camouflage advice? I'll have to charge you for it. Okay, this is a great question. Why can't you get a media pass? Good question. I could, is the answer. I've got a 12-year history of being a political commentator. No one can argue with my credentials as a political commentator, and commentary is a subset of media. I belong in the media. So why don't I? Actually, for a very specific strategic reason, uh, I have never needed it until COVID came along when all of a sudden I could use it to potentially be allowed to do things that I wouldn't be allowed to do otherwise. But I have an in principle problem with the idea that I'm allowed to do something because I have some special category, right? If they arrest me and they charge me, I want them to arrest and charge me, the, the citizen, not me, the media personality or, or whatever, right? I don't want my defense to be grounded in some special um, accreditation that I have. I want my defense to be grounded in human rights and the rights that we all share. If I'm going to go through a trial, because I don't want to, right? But if I'm going to go through a trial and put my family through all of that, I want the the outcome to be a precedent that other people can then use. And if I have media accreditation, there is a risk that the judge will then use that as a, the grounds to dismiss the charges or what have you. And I win, but all I've done is save my own skin. I haven't actually set a precedent that helps other people. So that is actually, that's genuinely, that's why I haven't done it. I could have done it. Uh, and yeah, it would allow me to stay at the protests, you know, and, and be a little bit bolder than what I am. Um, but ultimately my, my biggest, not my biggest fear, but one of my big fears is I have to go through all the trouble and the heartache and the cost and the stress of some big lawsuit. And in the end, all I've done is managed to get out of whatever charges and I haven't actually moved the needle for everybody else. So I want my defense to be grounded in something that is common with everybody else. And that's our human rights. And I don't want anything else interfering with that. Uh, okay. Possibly interview some whistleblowing nurses, doctors, and paramedics that have lost their jobs too. Yep. On it, on it. Uh, ba -ba. Ba -ba -ba. Um, Topher, use your gifts wisely, says Dober. Um, I try to, I try to, uh, and I will keep on uh, and trying to do more. Um, uh, ballpark ETA to release is hopefully before Christmas. I make no promises though. Things can go wrong. Things can get complicated. I could get arrested, which won't kill the project, but it will um, It will slow it down. Uh, Carol says, Rookshin is amazing. Rookshin is freaking amazing. And I will have him on a slow chat tomorrow night, 8 p.m. right here on my Facebook and YouTube channels. Um, ba -ba -bum. 
So excited for this. Thank you, Kate. Uh, very, 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 very excited for it as well. Uh, <laughs> I have the same question for Rookshin. Why does he stream in portrait rather than landscape? Peter, come along to the show tomorrow and remind me of that question. Uh, I would love to get his answer. Um, I'm actually I'm actually uh, familiar with Jenny, uh, but we've never spoken about any um, COVID-related stuff, so I might have to get in touch with Jenny uh, and find out what's happened uh, with all of that with her. Um, what time with Ruction? I'll set my alarm. It is going to be 8 p.m. tomorrow. Uh, what is the rest for? A huge range of things. So there's an enormous amount of man hours. Uh, there is a significant amount of equipment, but not a huge amount because we're mostly filming in studio with only a little bit of going on location. Uh, so most of it is in man hours, studio time. Uh, and you know, if you've ever had the opportunity, and look, this is this is something that I'd recommend everyone do once in your life because you'll never watch a movie or a TV show the same way ever again. Go and sign up at an agency to be a movie extra, right? Those people in the background that you never hear from, they're just kind of populating the scene. They're not randoms. They were all chosen and dressed in, you know, the, their clothing was was picked out for them by the, um, the, the third assistant director and they were placed where they belong uh, and, and have been told what to do and they've got to have conversations without actually making any noise and blah, blah, blah. There's a whole little art form to being an extra. But the thing that will blow your mind is the number of people on set, in any professional production, the sheer number of bodies. And I promise you, every single one of those people has a job. There is a reason they're there. The, the arts industry is not in the business of wasting money. The film industry is not in the business of spending money. It doesn't have to spend. Every single one of those people is there for a reason. And it's the same with the documentary. Now, the, with the documentary, those people aren't necessarily on set while you're filming. But if you were here earlier on, I talked about pre-production production, post-production. Pre-production is everything until the camera comes out, everything, all the organization and planning. And then post-production is everything after you put the camera away. Editing, color grading, audio grading, all of your music, all of your titles and your motion graphics, all of your marketing and all the other collateral that goes around that. The man hours involved in a project like this. This is, a, I mean, it's already been going for nearly a month. Uh, we've got another three months ahead of us. You think about four months with a small army of people working on something, that's your answer. That's where the money's going. Uh, will I get a psychologist to look at Daniel Andrews? I don't know if any psychologist is going to be willing to prognosticate, and nor, nor should they, to be honest, on someone that they haven't actually consulted with and actually done a face-to-face -face with. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, I, I, I doubt I would find anyone uh, willing to do that. Will Dan's – this is a good question. Will Dan still be relevant by the time the film is out? The consequences of Dan's actions will still be relevant. And even if Dan is gone, which there's always rumors, there's a new round of rumors going around at the moment that he's about to get knifed in the back. Look, I've bought into those rumors in the past. I've stopped buying into them because up until this moment in time, they've never been correct. Maybe at some point they will be correct. And maybe that's this time. All right. But we are still going to be unraveling and unpicking the consequences of what he did. And if it can happen to us once, it can happen to us again. There are lessons that need to be learned here. This is all about Daniel Andrews on the one hand. On the other hand, it's all about the people that allowed Daniel Andrews to do what he did, right? There's actually, there's two villains here. There's Daniel Andrews. He's the villain we can see. But then there's the silence of good people who did nothing. And that's the villain that we need to fix because that's what should have stopped Daniel Andrews from ever being able to do what he did. So I think this is going to be incredibly relevant no matter what happens to Daniel Andrews between now and release date. Uh, could I do exclusive members only snippets for a price? Um, look, I, I don't love that business model. Even even where I do have the subscribe star, subscribestar.com forward slash Topher Field, if you want to support me. Um, you know, yes, I have exclusive content that's only for financial supporters, but I tell people I don't put very much up there. Like, don't go and support me financially for the exclusive content. I'm sorry, there's just not enough of it. And I'm not going to put my time into the exclusive content. Understand the shift that happens. I'm, I'm trying to change the world. I'm one of those naive, stupid, romantic people who's trying to change the world. And that means that I need, I need my content to be seen and to be read and to be thought about by as many people as possible. The minute you start putting content behind a paywall, your focus shifts. You're no longer trying to do what you do because you want to make the world a better place. You start thinking about what can I write that is going to get me more subscribers and get me more money and you become a business. Now, maybe I should have become a business 10 years ago, right? Because my platform would probably be bigger. And I've had that conversation in slow chats before. My platform would be bigger. Maybe I would have had more influence than what I've had. Maybe there's an argument to be made, but I've also seen people that just go way too far. And it just becomes about this churn of, I'll tell you what you want to hear in return for money. 
And then they're just looking for more things to feed more things in of what you want to hear. Well, anyone that's watching any of my slow chats and, and seen me engage with my audience, I have no trouble telling people what they don't want to hear or telling people where to go. Why? Because I don't have a financial dog in the fight. I, I, my, my ability to pay bills at the end of the month is not necessarily at stake, although some months it gets close. Um, you know, whereas someone who is, who is depend, someone who has gone down that business route as an influencer rather than as a, a passionate person trying to make a difference, they end up really compromising for the sake of, of money. Uh, ba -ba -ba. Has Candace been in touch? Uh, not at this point. No idea if she will. Uh, yes, Melbourne camouflage, cup of coffee in a green Woolies bag. That is a good one. Uh, no cigar tonight. I actually, I lit one up and then I let it go out because I wasn't paying enough attention to it. And I just decided, you know what? I'm just going to, just going to talk. Um, da -da -da. Uh, Jess says, love this. I don't know what specifically, but thank you, Jess. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, I want to do this, but I'm, this is another area where you guys can help me. Okay, because so can you possibly interview some people I think we've all wondered about how they are now, like the granny who was bulldozed by Vic Pol, the dude who was slammed into the ground, me, Ruction, Ivy, the construction workers who are at the doors of the CFMEU. Yeah, I, I really want to get in touch with some of these victims of Vic Pol's uh, aggression, um, but I have no way directly to contact them. There's not some magic button that I, as a, as a political commentator, can push and, and contact these people. So there will be a list of people that will go out uh, to all of you, my amazing uh, supporters, <coughs> in the hope that some of you may know someone or know someone who knows someone, and through the grapevine, I can potentially get in touch with some of these people to interview them and have them in the doco if they're willing, but if they're not, to at least be able to talk about the outcome and to actually be able to tell everybody What's the outcome or where are things up to now in their particular situation? So absolutely, uh, definitely want to do that. Early Christmas present would be nice. Uh, I don't know if you're talking about the doco or, uh, or Daniel Andrews resigning, but either or both of those would be good. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. <laughs> well, I guess, uh, I guess you know what the most popular question tomorrow night is going to be. I'm guessing it's going to be to do with portrait or landscape. Uh, portrait is how the Zoomers watch things now. Yeah, uh, but I, I just think landscape, you you just catch a lot more. Uh, you just with that wider view, I think, you know. Um, ba -ba -ba. Yeah, Kate says, yep, used to do extra work, took so long, you're not even guaranteed to be in the final letter. It's amazing. People don't realize a single conversation, a relatively simple interaction between two characters that happens can take a half day or even a full day to film all of the different angles and the coverage of the wide shot, the person walks up, then they got the two shot, the reverse two shot, then they got the dirty single and they got the clean single and then maybe a couple of detail shots of picking up a drink or something being poured or whatever it may be. There's a day, there's an entire day gone and you've got an army, but you've got a hundred people on set potentially with all the extras in the back of the cafe and all the people walking past outside and then all the actual technical people, then all of the administrative people that go along with any film. You know, they've just paid a hundred people for an entire day just to record the footage for one conversation. And then, of course, it has to get edited, color graded, audio graded, and everything else. Um, typically, high-end feature films now, uh, you want to be budgeting. The, 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 the back of the envelope ballpark number is you want to budget around about a million dollars per finished minute. So if you want to make a 90-minute film, you're going to need about $90 million, right? In that context, $65,000 for a 90-minute documentary, bargain. Um, okay. Would I consider a sponsor in exchange for advertising like cigars and whiskey? I can't advertise cigars, uh, Australian advertising laws. Uh, however, I'm certainly not against um, a sponsor. If someone is willing to attach their brand, I mean, look, I'm not everyone's cup of tea. I'm not everyone's flavor. My wife literally lost a client earlier today because the client's partner found out that she's married to Topher. $10,000 client, gone. Uh, because someone can't do business with someone whose politics they like, apparently. Um, so I get it. I get that I'm not everyone's cup of tea. And um, But if you have a brand or you have a business or, or you know a business where you might be willing to do something like that, definitely. I will, of course, disclose that it's a financial relationship and I want to see what it is first because I don't like, I'm not going to recommend stuff that I don't actually think is okay. Uh, but if it ticks all those boxes, then yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm open to it for sure. Uh, ba I hope you'll be interviewing Bogut. I would love to. Um, whether he's going to be willing to or not is another matter. He's got sort of a bigger reputation uh, and whether he wants to attach it to a documentary, I'm not sure, but I'll reach out to him and hopefully we can. Uh, ba -ba -ba. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. A quote that says, education is not knowing that Hitler killed 6 million Jews. Education is knowing that 13 million ordinary Germans were convinced that it was required. Yep. Yep, that's the tragedy. Um, postcard prints for us to go letterboxing with. Hey, if, if we've got budget, all of those things can uh, can definitely happen. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Oh, where are they now series would be good on the victims of, of violence. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Zoe Buller. How about that mum who was arrested in Ballarat last year? She was one of the first. I am going to try and, and find her and see if she's willing to talk. Um, I believe all of her charges were dropped, uh, thanks, I think, to the IPA, helping her with uh, some getting some good lawyers and stuff like that. I think I, I may be misrepresenting that. Um, so I think she'd be free to talk if she's willing to talk. That's that's then the issue with, with someone like her, where she was just a completely ordinary mum and suddenly thrust into the limelight. She may have decided to go very quiet. Um, I don't know. I don't know. So these are all the people that I want to I want to try and, and talk to. Um, ba -ba. Will the doco investigate Jaron Weimar and Brett Sutton? Probably not. Just simply, simply due to time, um, we're we're really we're focused on on three main things. We're focused on the laws and Daniel Andrews, and and I mean we will discuss it in the sense of how Victoria operated because it's an absolute crime the way that Victoria has been run. Um, so it, it will come up. Their names will come up, but we're not going to be going deep into any of those sorts of rabbit holes. So we're focused on the way that Victoria has been run and the rules that have been brought in. We're focused on the media and the, the way the media have tried to control the narrative and carry water for the government, the lies that they've told, the names that they've called people, etc., uh, and then the protests and the protestors, uh, the violence and everything that's gone along with that. Those are kind of the three key through lines all the way from start to finish. Um, and spending time on the health side of things, we're not going to be going deep into the coronavirus. We're not going to be talking about ivermectin. We're not going to be – there's a whole lot of stuff that we just can't. For, for a range of reasons, whether it's due to censorship issues or whether it's just the fact that we've got 90 minutes to tell this story. And the story that needs to be told in the context of this documentary is about the abuse of human rights and the loss of freedoms and how quickly that happened and how many people cheered that on. That's really the story. And then obviously it's through the eyes of the people that were trying to stop it, through the eyes of the people that were trying to preserve those freedoms. So, um, yeah. Um, I hope your wife told that ten thousand dollar customer where to jam it. We don't need those types. Well, it gets worse because uh, the not the partner, but the one that she was actually dealing with has been a friend of ours and has met me multiple times. And she's like, "Oh well, I don't really have a problem with it, but my partner's got a problem with it, so now we can't use you." Yeah, sure, whatever. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. Okay. Um... Yeah, so this is interesting. I haven't put the video up yet, uh, and I probably won't. So go to Rukshan's page for this, uh, Real Rukshan on Facebook, Instagram, and he's probably on Telegram as well. I'm not actually sure. Can you talk about the admittance of no mandatory vaccinations for authorized workers that came out today on Rukshan's page? There are two really interesting things about this. Number one, when they announced oh, authorized workers have to be vaccinated, it was a long list of workers, right? That list is gone now. Right, that list has suddenly disappeared. You'll still find it in old newspaper articles. The Age did an article where they gave the list. You'll still find it there, but you won't find it on any government website. No explanation has been given for why that happened. But number two is what you're referring to, and, and Rukshan put a video up of it today. David Limbrick uh, of the Liberal Democrats, not the Liberal Party, the Liberal Democrats, completely different party. David's one of the good guys. He's been doing fantastic work all the way through this. And he asked a, a question, basically trying to, to find out from the government, what are the implications for employers uh, if they have an employee who refuses to be vaccinated or refuses to disclose their vaccination status. <clears throat> and the lengths that the minister, I think it was the employment minister, I think it was, um, went to to avoid the question and ultimately never answered it, um, makes me very suspicious and a lot of other people very suspicious, hence this video has been being posted around a lot, uh, that actually they already know that these mandates don't work right? Because she didn't just come out and say, well, it's mandatory. And so they should just tell them to F off and, and they've got to go and do it. She said, well, they should really get alongside them and talk to them about the importance of protecting the community. And she had a whole bunch of trash language, like the manipulation of the English language is disgusting. Um, but effectively admitted by omission that they don't have the power to actually 
mandate it. Now, that's a reading into it. She would say, well, I never said that. And she'd be right. She did never say that. But she certainly never said that they had the mandate. Uh, and the advice that she was giving in terms of what employers should or could do uh, was, was very powerless, right? It wasn't coming from a position of strength of, well, this has to happen. They have to do it. It wasn't coming from that position at all. So very, very interesting. Um, David is a good and decent human being. We are lucky to have him in Victoria, 100%. David Limbrick and Tim Quilty. Uh, now, Catherine Cumming more recently has done some very good work as well. There's a liberal MP whose name escapes me who's done some good work more recently as well. Um, but David Limbrick and Tim Quilty were the ones that stuck their necks out first and furthest. David Limbrick himself has been arrested um, and didn't pull the politician card, didn't try and get out of it. Um, yeah, Dr. Dribbs, she first, so this is the minister was in the video, she launched into a smear rant at Limbrick and his supporters, 100%, really, really disgusting stuff. And if David Limbrick did that back to a female MP, can you imagine the outrage? You know, if he'd made some sneering remark about communist supporters for her, can you imagine the outrage, the media, you know, the media minutes and the column inches that we would be dedicated to the backlash from that? Uh, well, we have some time to show how overseas media has been covering what's been happening. Yes, that is the media is a big part of this and talking about the contrast between our local media and foreign media, our local politicians and foreign politicians making that contrast, because what it does is it breaks down the gaslighting and people have been in comments that I've kind of skipped through, been talking about the fact that there's been gaslighting going on 100% there has, you're absolutely right. <clears throat> um, people need the validation that they're not crazy. You know, there's a lot of people in Victoria who are who are being broken down by this. And oh. um, they need the validation and they need to be reminded that they're not the crazy ones. They've been gaslighted. The politicians have lied to them. The government has lied to them. The police have lied to them. The media have lied to them. But foreign media could see it clearly and foreign politicians could see it much more clearly than what our local politicians could. So that is definitely going to be a major sub-theme within the documentary, 100%. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Cool. What, what is the time? Yeah, cool. Okay. Well, so guys, tonight I've talked about the doco. Uh, I spent, I think, probably the first hour or so on that. I talked about the whole production process, the budget, where the money's going, what's actually going to be in the doco, what are the, the component parts, the main themes of what the doco is going to be about. Um, obviously, I would love for you to help this get funded. If you've already supported me, then thank you so much. Please help spread the word. Please help get the word out. Uh, to make sure that I reach this minimum $65,000 budget. I, I just can't realistically uh, try and do it for, for less than that. We're already at 11%. So thank you. Thank you so much to everyone that has helped it to get to that point. Uh, I'm just going to post the link in again. Um, just if you could just spread this, please, and just tell people about it. Grab the poster uh, that I've posted on my Facebook page, copy it onto your computer, upload it again yourself with the link to the fundraiser, et cetera, so that it's just propagating everywhere across social media. Um, talk to anyone that you know who might be willing to make a, a bigger donation. Obviously, the smaller donations are fantastic and they add up, but then on those times when you do get someone uh, who who comes in and, and just throws $1,000 in or something like that, that, it's just amazing. It just makes a huge difference. So if you do know people that might be willing to do that, then that would be much appreciated if you could um, if you could reach out to them and see if they'd be willing to do it. Here is the um, the the URL here: givesendgo.com forward slash battleground melbourne. So eleven percent after what six hours, seven hours thereabouts uh, since I actually launched the campaign. So it's a great start, and I'm I'm really really grateful to everyone. But we've got to keep it going because there's still eighty nine percent that that needs to go, and that's just to get to the minimum. That's just to get to the point where I actually have the resources that I need to do this and to do it. At a, at a decent professional level. So if you guys can just help to keep on getting that out there and get us to that $65,000 mark, then we can just grow and, and continue from there. And hopefully by the time we finish the documentary, more donations will come in and we'll be at the point where we've got marketing budget and other things as well that we can do. So thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate your time tonight. I've actually got to film a, I've got a European podcast that wants me on in half an hour. So I'm going to take a break, try and get my throat to stop being quite so sore. Uh, and uh, maybe drink some lem sip or something like that and then get ready to go again for an hour or so on a podcast until 11 o'clock tonight and that'll get published later in the week or the week after and I'll put it on my page once that has been published. So thank you for your company. I do appreciate it. Make sure you tune in for tomorrow night's slow chat with Rukshan. I've been looking forward to that for six weeks. I haven't announced it until now because I know that he's a man in demand 
Uh, and obviously, if something happens tomorrow with some protest blows up and he's out live streaming all day, then that may have to get postponed. But all going well, fingers crossed. I'll have Rookshan on 8 p.m. tonight, same place, YouTube and Facebook, uh, for a nice, slow chat. So thank you so much for joining me. We'll see you tomorrow night.